Bogren Digital has been releasing a number of really simple one knob guitar and bass amp sims. I was convinced that they would only ever release these types of one knob style plugins, but I was totally wrong. Bogren Digital just released the MLC Sub Zero 100 guitar amp suite, and this thing is an absolute monster and perfect for those that want a little bit more customization over their guitar tone. They also announced a new technology in this amp sim that supposedly recreates all the nonlinear missing components that typically impulse responses can't recreate. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through all the settings, demo some different amp sounds, and dive into this new technology to see if it's as good as they really claim. Now, Bogren Digital did send me this plugin to review, but it's not a paid review. So everything that I say in this video is 100% my own opinion. And if you need some extra help getting your guitars to sound great in a mix, I have a metal mixing cheat sheet that contains all of my favorite go-to EQ and compression settings. And this is a sheet that you can print out and have by you when you're mixing your next song. So here is the Sub-Zero 100 plugin. We can navigate between the different pages of this plugin by clicking on these little buttons up here which happened to look hilariously close to neural DSP plugins. I think the layout was probably inspired by some of their plugins. The signal flow goes from left to right, and unfortunately, there's no way to rearrange this order. This first page contains two overdrive pedals. This first one is called Vanilla Sky, and it's just like a more plain, vanilla-sounding overdrive pedal. It retains a lot more of the characteristic of the guitar and the amp and just kind of adds a little bit of mojo to it. This other overdrive pedal is the OVD-1, and this is gonna be similar to like a Tube Screamer. It does a lot of stuff to the mid-range, and it and really pushes the amp in a more aggressive direction. Here is the amp control page. Here we have a lot more than just the one knob like all those previous Bogren amp sims. Some notable differences include three different amp channels right here. We also have a onboard gate, as well as depth and presence knobs here, and also the ability to switch between 6L6 and EL34 tubes. We also have some gain switches to kind of modify the gain structure of the different amps, and some high switches, and also this uh, power amp modification circuit. And then of course we have a three band EQ right here in the middle. Now this is the fun part, on this third page, this is where the impulse response loader is, and this thing is on steroids. Bogren Digital has this new IRDX technology, and it's implemented on this page. And I spoke with the team that designed this, and they said they're using neural networks to basically reconstruct any of the missing components that an IR or an impulse response doesn't capture. Okay, so this is gonna be all those nonlinear components that are missing from a lot of the guitar amp sims that are on the market right now. So that'll include differences in dynamics, some saturation, and possibly some other things. And this IRDX technology single-handedly kind of separates this Bogren Digital Amp Sim from all the others on the market. Something else that's really cool that you can do is you can use this Amp Suite and bypass all these other pages. So by holding Alt or Command and clicking, you can disable all these tabs but you can leave this one open and then load your own impulse responses into this page. And that allows you to use the IRDX technology on your impulse responses that you already own. So this will help make them sound a little bit more realistic. Kind of a cool little thing you can do. So this IR loader has multiple different microphone choices. You can see we have a SM57, this uh, probably a Neumann U67. This is probably an SM7B. Uh, and then a, a Royer 121. So, I mean, these are all very common microphones that you might want to use when you're recording a guitar amp. And you have them all built in to this impulse response loader. You can also move the microphone position in two dimensions. So you can see there's this little chart here. Back is adds distance. And then uh, left and right is obviously left and right of the speaker. You also have the ability to change the angle, which is pretty cool. So there is a lot of tonal configurations you can do between this two-dimensional IR loader here and then also the angle effect. They also give you the ability to load another impulse response on the other side, and then you have this really cool little blender function that allows you to mix and match different impulse responses using the IRDX technology. There's a lot of tweaking you can do if you get this amp suite. 
We go to this next page. This gives you access to a pretty musical graphic equalizer. That's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> This last page gives you two different effects plugins. You have a delay and a reverb pedal. And honestly, both of these sound pretty incredible to me. They're definitely dialed in to make the guitar sound great. And it's not just like your normal run of the mill delay and reverb. They really do sound awesome on a guitar. Down here in this bottom corner is the ability to change the quality of this guitar amp suite. Of course, it's going to use a little bit more CPU. And this switch does more than just adjust an oversampling. It also improves the quality of the modeling within the plugin. Now, something that isn't really mentioned anywhere that I found digging underneath the hood of this plugin is that when you render any of your guitar tracks down with this plugin, it's going to, by default, go to an ultra high setting. It actually will render it down higher quality than you can get with this ultra quality switch. And that really does a good job of taking care of any aliasing and other nuances that we really don't want in our guitar tone. Don't be afraid to change this to normal quality when you're just working on your mix, because when you render it down, it's going to sound even better. So this really wouldn't be a Raytown Productions review of a plugin if I didn't look under the hood to some degree. Okay, so let's bypass all the stuff and just take a look at what's happening with the different guitar amps. So here's the first channel. This is the clean channel with the gain maxed out, okay? This is what a perfectly clean signal looks like. What we're doing is we're running a sweep, a sound sweep from 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 hertz with time. So every five seconds it refreshes the sweep. I have it muted so it doesn't drive you nuts. But this is basically showing us the frequency response coming out of the plugin. The yellow and red are the loudest sounds. Blue is inaudible. Light blue is probably still inaudible, okay? So this just says that it goes from a bass frequency to a really high frequency. Now when we turn this amp on, what we see right away is a change to that initial sweep that's going into the, the guitar amp. We're getting a lot of these other lines that look similar to our initial sweep, right? So these are the harmonics. This is what gives a guitar amp its tone. Okay, and what we don't want to see is a bunch of extra little reflections back down from the top of this graph. That is caused from aliasing. That's just a phenomenon with digital sampling and physics. But we shouldn't see a lot of that if the plugin is well designed. Okay, so this is really good. It's a nice, clean looking plugin. We go to the mid gain channel, which is more of like a plexi sound. We also see that it's relatively clean. Okay. So we're not getting a lot of reflections that come back down into the audible range. And then if we go to the high gain setting, it's also very clean, not a lot of aliasing. Now, if we turn off this ultra quality, now we can see that there's a bunch of these reflections that come back down. So that's the aliasing I'm talking about. This is not really desired. It's non-musical. It just adds a lot of top end hiss and sizzle to uh, this plugin. So ideally we wouldn't want that. But like I mentioned earlier, you render your guitars with this plugin, it's going to put it in an ultra high quality mode. So you're not going to get any of this aliasing when you're printing your songs down. And I doubt you'd be even able to hear any of this aliasing anyways. Okay, channel two. Now we're seeing a lot more aliasing. This you might actually be able to pick up on. Okay, so it's just going to add a little bit of that high end sizzle and maybe make the guitars start feeling a little harsh. But all you have to do, again, if you want to get rid of that, you just turn that high quality mode on and you're good to go. Okay, if we look at the high gain channel, uh, it actually has less aliasing than the mid gain channel, which I don't really understand, but it's interesting to note anyways. This plugin seems like it's well designed, so let's uh, take a look at the linear analysis. On the clean channel, when we change the gain, we can see that the frequency response is changing on this channel. And when you get to 10-ish, that's when you start getting a lot of really crazy changes to the frequency response, as you'll hear when I dial this in in an actual session in a second. What's interesting is that, of course, Bogren Digital would make their gain knob go to 11 and not to 10 for all you old people like me on Spinal Tap reference there. Let's take a look at what the EQ does for the bass frequencies. And again, this isn't like a linear thing, right? As we change this, it's going up really fast. And once we get towards the top, it starts slowing down and shifting to lower frequencies. So they did a really nice job modeling the behavior of all these different EQs because it, they're definitely moving in a way that isn't just a very basic, like parametric EQ shape, right? This is 
There's more to this. Okay, same with the uh, treble, right? This you increase the treble, but what it actually is doing is moving the mid range and like scooping out different frequencies. Okay, which will give it the impression that you're increasing the top end. And it also boosts the low end a lot when you increase the treble, right? Just very interesting. So if we go to bright two, you can see there's a bump up in the high end. We go to bright one, it changes again. And then without it, the top end is significantly lower, okay? This low EQ button basically is just going to extend out the bass frequencies a little bit more than previously. Okay, it's just going to add a little bit of warmth or maybe some thickness to the signal. And then this feed button, you can see what it does. It modifies the top and low end a little bit. If we go to channel two. This is where it starts getting interesting. Again, you can see the frequency balance changing as we increase the gain. And that's because of the different harmonic structure that's being generated. If we want to look into that a little bit further, we can come to the harmonic analysis. So all these extra little peaks that we see beyond the 1000 Hertz are generated from this amp sim. So if I bypass this, that's the signal we're feeding into the amp. And this is the signal coming out. So we have a lot of harmonics as we increase that, you can see how they're all kind of changing. And some of them are reflecting back down as aliasing. But again, it's at a very low level. I don't think it's going to be a problem. If we change the tube setting. You can see that we're getting a little bit of change in the gain structure. There's a drop in volume. And also, the frequency balance might change just subtly. I don't know if it's doing a lot to the harmonics. Let's see. It might change the harmonic structure a little bit, but I really can't tell. We'll, we'll figure it out when we actually dial it in. In the high gain, you can see the difference, right? We have the gain maxed out. This has a lot more of this like warmth and thickness. And this is going to have a much more controlled, tighter, low end of the guitar tone. We're also getting a nice presence bump here. And then we have a very extended top end, right? We're going to get a lot of this like 5K, 4K frequencies in the signal. And that's going to give you that, that really polished modern metal sound. Cool. Let's see what this graphical EQ looks like and what it does. So as we raise this up, you can see the shape. It looks like it might be changing the width of the of the band as you increase it, meaning the Q is getting tighter at the high numbers compared to down here. This looks like it's better for like a tonal shaping. And as you really push it, it starts getting more narrow for like doing more selective frequency adjustment. Something to mention is we are getting some EQ cramping here at the very high end. Okay, that just means that your shape becomes asymmetrical. Whether or not that actually matters, that's an argument that the internet loves to have. I don't know. I think it's probably fine if it's cramping. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is how it actually sounds when you get done mixing your guitar. And then finally, I can't do really anything with these effects, so I'll pull you in a session, and then we'll experiment with how these actually sound. So I think probably the best way for me to show you the sound of this amp is just to go through some presets so you can hear it for yourself, and I'll make some adjustments as we go. So if we go to the clean channel, So it actually sounds pretty good to me. I feel like a lot of amp sims don't do very well, especially when you have like, you're right on the edge of a clean breakup sound. They, they just tend to sound really static. And I feel like this actually feels pretty, pretty real to me. All right, let's go check out another one. Sweet clean. Okay, that has a little bit of uh, delay and reverb on this one. Let's keep going. Pretty awesome. Clean swag. So this one's on that clean channel. Yeah, that bright one switch really brings out the pick attack. And then we have a uh, real sparkle. And here you can really hear how those effects are really dialed in for guitar tone. Let's modify this reverb and delay a little bit so you can get a feel for how cool these pedals actually sound. So let me turn off the delay.
It has a low cut so you can tighten up the reverb so it doesn't ever get your guitar tone sounding muddy. And that size is really nice. It gives it like this massive feel. Cool. All right, let's check out this delay. It has a ping pong feature and we can adjust the feedback so it doesn't keep bouncing back and forth forever. And we'll turn that sync off and manually dial in the repeats. Oh, that's kind of cool. You hear how the uh, the tone changes as you dial this up and down. That's kind of like, uh, it makes it a little bit more realistic feeling. So if you automate it, then you'll get that like drop in tone that you get if you were actually to reach on your pedals and start tweaking things in real time. Let's try the tap tempo feature and see if we can get this synced up. Cool. Yeah, it worked great. Turn this mix down. And you just get this really cool, like, ethereal sound. All right, let's check out some, like, more aggressive tones, since this is supposed to be a distorted guitar anyways. Man, it sounds so thick. And that is just a super tight guitar sound, man. And you can see that the all the microphones are changing. They're blending impulse responses using different cabs. Uh, like I said, the tweaking is almost endless. Yeah, they all sound really good. All right, so let's go to the high gain stuff, and then I'm going to dive into this IRDX technology. So there, there you go, that's that high gain sound. And you can hear immediately, it already has a lot more top end on it, so it sounds a lot more aggressive, a lot more abrasive for modern metal. And all these presets sound so good. You'd really hear like on the uh, the downstroke, right? The pick attack, it like jumps out of the speakers. And that comes back to this IRDX technology. Right, it's like lunging out, like it has like a little bit more energy, like it, like a real guitar amp would have. Let me go back, let me disable this and notice how it goes from like kind of lunging out of the speakers and having this three dimensional sound to being, kind of just flat and lifeless and just hanging out. Check this out. To me, it's like night and day. Let's over-exaggerate this so it is even more aggressive. It also makes the, the guitars feel like super close to the listener, and it's adding a lot to the top end. Uh, you can hear it. It's, it's, it's like uh, it's saturating the signal somehow. I don't know. I don't know what it's doing. I don't know if anybody knows what it's doing. Supposedly, this is generated using neural networks. Basically, you ask the computer to match the differences between one thing and another, and it makes up some algorithm, and we really don't know what that is. But that is what's bridging the gap between a static IR and an actual guitar cabinet. And it's all the magic of their algorithm is right here in this IRDX technology. And like I said earlier, you can bypass all this other stuff by holding Alt, clicking that. And you can load in any of your own IRs and then use this IRDX technology to maybe waken them up and make them sound even more realistic. So just go here, click on that load IR button, and you're good to go. So let's dive into the song, shall we? This is without any guitar. Here, 
Tom the Guitars. It is so massive. It's crazy. I'm doing this with uh, two guitar DIs, and I have this Sub Zero plugin loaded on my group channel. So I have this pan to the left, this DI pan to the right, and then they're coming here. And I just have one instance because I'm trying to be good about CPU usage. And what you can do is actually click this little button, go to preferences, and then tell it to use a stereo input mode. Okay, so you don't want mono, we want stereo, and then that way it's going to treat these both as separate channels, and then so you get the same tone, but basically using less processing, right? So that's a fun little CPU saver for all of you. Let's see how it sounds in the mix when we have this IRDX technology off, and then when it's on. Okay, so I'm gonna put it to 150, just so we can really hear if it makes a big difference in the actual mix. Because that's what really matters. It doesn't matter how it sounds in isolation. It matters how it sounds in the mix. Here we go. So this is a little tricky, right? Because we're saturating the signal, we're adding some dynamics to it, so the volume level is changing, right? If we switch this on and off in solo, the IRDX technology being on sounds louder. So we have a little bit of a bias here that we have to be careful of when we're flipping back and forth. So let me just show you what I mean. Let's look at the average level without this on. So minus 10.4, if we turn this on, what's the level go to? So it's like 0.7 dB louder, okay? That is enough to fool you into thinking it sounds better just from the volume increase, okay? That doesn't get into perceived volume increase and all that other crazy stuff. Human brains are really complicated. Let's copy this setting we have to another preset here, make the adjustment in gain, so we can make an objective decision on if this IRDX technology actually sounds better in a mix. Okay, so let's just copy all of our settings over to the B channel. Now when we come to B, we can lower the output by 0.7, and now the volume should be similar. Let's check. All right, so now we're basically 10.5 for both. Let's check it out in the mix. And these are the nuances that a lot of different channels don't consider, okay? So really take the time, do a scientific analysis of what's really going on. Try to minimize your biases anytime you're testing new things out. Make sure you're always level matching because it's the easiest way to fool your brain into thinking it sounds better. It doesn't usually sound better. It usually is just louder, okay? Let's start with the IRDX technology off and we're gonna turn it on. We'll see what actually sounds better. Here we go. I think I actually prefer it on. And maybe you have a different opinion, that's cool. Um, I just like what it does in terms of uh, the perceived depth of the guitar. It feels like it's closer, and it feels a little bit more 3D in this mix to me. Again, I have it cranked to 150%, and if you go less than that, you're gonna get closer to just a standard IR sound. It's, you're gonna lose some of that saturation and all the other non-linearities that that neural network has identified that's missing between a, a standard static impulse response and the real guitar cap. So what did you think about that IRDX technology? Do you think it's a game changer for guitar amp suites? Or do you think it's really not that special? Let me know in the comments below. Also, because Bogren Digital is awesome, they're giving all Raytown subscribers 10% off any of the products in their store. Now, that 
Coupon doesn't always work if the products are already on sale, but hey, if you want to save money, if you like money, whatever your reason, you can just put the coupon code RAYTOWN in the shopping cart when you're checking out and it'll give you 10% off. All that stuff is in the description. And also in the description that's totally free is my mixing cheat sheet for rock and metal music. So download that, print it out, put it on your desk, and use that as a reference when you're working on your next song. It's super handy, and I think you're gonna find it really valuable. So if you're still here, thank you so much for your time and attention today. My name is Bobby Bailo. I'm the Mixing Mastering Engineer at Raytown Productions, and I hope to see you in another video.